Now, carrying back on here with it, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 through chapter 3, verse 24. Just to reorient you here, John focuses on this ethical component of abiding in Christ. The fact that remaining in Christ involves continuing to live out one's faith. That's what I mean by an ethical component of abiding, is that it includes this sense of continuing to live in submission to Jesus. And in the first half of that section, so we have that rather lengthy section, the first half of it, in 228 through 310, he stresses that abiding in Christ, it involves right living. And then that section really, this is the way I see it, in two halves. He has the idea that he speaks first of, in 228 through 33 of right living in Christ's second coming. And then in 34 through 310, he speaks of right living in Christ's first coming. And then we get to the second half of that section, 311 through 324. He becomes more specific with regard to right living, and he stresses that abiding in Christ involves loving one another. And then he, then he has there, that section has a couple of subsections in it that we'll talk about in a minute. Now, when we ended last week, we were almost through the section, chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, where John is stressing that those who sin habitually, those who live in sin, those who wallow in sin, do not have a relationship with God despite what they may say. And I want to just pick back up. We're almost through. We went through verse 9. And I'll pick back up in, in chapter 3, verse 10, where it says, By this it is evident who are the children of God and the children of the devil. Everyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, including the one who does not love his brother. Now, see, given that those born of God do not live in sin, they do not sin as a matter of course or habit. Well, a criterion for recognizing the children of God and the children of the devil is whether they practice righteousness. Do they live consistently with a confession of faith in Jesus Christ? They are recognized by their fruits. So what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. Now, of course, that statement, as I've said a number of times, it has to be understood in the context of the letter. Where he's writing, to whom he's writing, and the circumstances there, he's addressing the issue of whether professing Christians baptize believers who, ne who now deny the need to practice righteousness. These false teachers who had gone out from them. So he's speaking about them, people who were baptized believers who then drifted into heresy and they deny the need to practice righteousness. That's the context. He's saying, do they, are they in a relationship with God? Okay, and the answer, of course, throughout the letter is no, they're not. So his words, you can't take his words to mean, look, a diligent pursuit of righteousness by somebody who doesn't believe Jesus is the Christ, that that means they're children of God. You, you see, I mean, because th that's not the situation into which he's writing. So he doesn't want to stop and say, by the way, of course, I don't want you to misunderstand this. I'm not saying, okay, he will make this explicit in a bit. But I've said it a number of times. I won't say it again. I just want you to understand that. Now, the last clause of verse 10, where I, including the one who does not love his brother, he specifies there, see, that the practice of righteousness that marks one as a child of God includes loving other Christians. And I take the conjunction there in the sense of including. It can have that meaning. So that's, I said, everyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, including the one who does not love his brother. And see this mention here of this, of this key failure of the false teachers. Remember that they had gone out, they had uh, seceded, from the faithful, they were rejecting the faithful, they were not loving the faithful. Well, this key failure of the heretics and their followers, that then sets the stage for the comments that follow. So right at the end there, you see, at the end of 10, now we go into 11 to 24, this idea of abiding involves loving one another. So he says, including uh, loving one another, and, and then he, he launches into this next section. Okay, so he says in, in 3.11 to 15, he speaks about abiding 
involves loving one another, and he talks about the importance of loving one another. He says, for this is the message which we heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And for what reason did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil, but the ones of his brother were righteous. Do not be amazed, brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers. The one who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that every murderer does not have eternal life abiding in him. Perhaps a better way would say no murderer, but I've gone through that before too. I like to keep it every murderer, meaning no murderer, has eternal life uh, in him. Now he says in verse, in verse 11, this command to love one another, that was part of their foundational ethical instruction. This was something they had from the get-go, something that was passed on to them when they first heard the gospel. This idea of the need, the message which you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. There is a responsibility. There is an obligation. We are to love brothers and sisters in Christ. We love everybody, but, you know, do good to all people, especially what? To the household of faith? You see, there is a connection between brothers and sisters those who are Christians. And he says this was something that they had from the beginning. Then he says in verse 12, so not like Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother, and for this reason did he murder him because his deeds were evil and the ones of his brother were righteous. Well, that implies that not loving one's brother would make one like Cain. See, not loving your brother or your sister would make you like Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. That is implied there, and it's made explicit in verse 15. Now, Cain's sin, it was prompted by spiritual jealousy. Why? It says, because his deeds were evil, giving an unacceptable offering, but his brother Abel's deeds were righteous, giving an acceptable offering. You see that in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. And then he says in verse 13, Do not be amazed. Brothers, if the world hates you. Well, this follows this precedent that he's just given. He said you have, you have Cain and Abel, and Cain murdered Abel. Why? Because his deeds were evil, but, but Abel's were righteous. So you had spiritual jealousy at work that prompted Cain to murder Abel. And in light of that, it shouldn't, they shouldn't be surprised that the world which includes the false teachers, as he says in chapter 4, verse 5, they shouldn't be surprised that the world hates, which is murderous in principle, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, 21 and 22. So you sh- if, if Cain murdered Abel out of spiritual jealousy because his deeds were evil and Abel's were righteous, you should not be surprised if the world hates you. The world hates which is murderous in principle you. Well, why? Because your deeds are righteous, but the world's are what? Evil. You see, this whole theme here, he's talking about this idea of how do you live? Cain murders Abel because his deeds are evil and Abel's are righteous, so you shouldn't be surprised that the world hates you. It follows from that precedent. You are of God. You live righteously, and those who are of the world do not. So therefore, just as Cain murdered Abel, it shouldn't, you shouldn't be surprised that the world hates you. And he says in verse 14, We know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brothers. The one who does not love abides in death. You see, we know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brothers. The command to love, it's so fundamental that it can serve as a test for salvation, as a test of the presence of saving faith and thus the presence of regeneration, the presence of new birth, the presence of new life. Because this is, this is something, see, that it's so fundamental, this idea of loving, that it can serve and function as a test in that regard. The presence of love attests to the genuineness of his and his readers' faith. He says, look, we know. 
you know, he says, we know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brothers. We have this fruit of our faith, this, this attesting of the genuineness of our faith and our conversion and our regeneration. So we know that we've passed from death to life. The presence of love attests to that genuineness and of his and his reader's faith, and hence it attests to their passage from death to life. That's what he's talking about. Now, the absence of love in the lives of the false teachers proves what? They abide in death. How are they treating you? They're shunning you, rejecting you, treating you as outcasts, but you are the true people of God. So the very fact they do not love you shows that they are not of God and they abide in death. And we, because we love the brothers and sisters, We've passed from death to life, and we know that. Then he says in verse 15, that everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. See, he's a murderer, going right back to what he said about Cain and Abel. And you know that every murderer does not have eternal life abiding in him. No murderer has eternal life. So those who hates his brother is a murderer. It's just as he says in chapter 2, 11, and 10. You remember there are like just the two categories, love and hate? You see, when we went through that, you just have to. That's how John, he, it's, it's just two, two avenues, two categories. You love them or you hate them. And he says here, you know, like there, he says, the one who loves, and then he contrasts that to the one who hates. Well, that's what you're seeing here. All who hate, meaning all who do not love a brother or sister, the Spirit of God, through John, says, are murderers. Whew. He says, are murderers, you see. And no, mur and, and no one who lives as a murderer has eternal life. Well, who's he focusing on? Well, he's focusing on the false teachers who don't love the faithful, who don't love the orthodox, who have rejected the orthodox. And he's trying to protect them from their influence by letting them know, you see that? You know that no, in, anybody like that, they don't have eternal life. On the contrary, they abide in death, just as he stated. Then he says in 3.16 to 18, In this we have known love, that that one laid down his life on our behalf, and we ought to lay down the lives of us, our lives, on behalf of the brothers. But whoever has the goods of the world and sees his brother having need, and closes his innards to him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in action and truth. So he says in verse 16, so I read the paragraph, and then I go back, as you see, and I try to hit each of the verses. He says, in this we have known love, that that one laid down his life on our behalf, and we ought to lay down our lives, the lives of us, on behalf of the brothers, Jesus showed the way of love. This is what love really is about. You know, we have so romanticized love, and I understand there's a romantic element to sexual love between a man and a woman. But you can't strip away from love this commitment to welfare, this commitment to blessing. That is a common element of love. You see, and Jesus showed the way of love, what it means to love by giving up his own life for the benefit of others. Now think about that. In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down his life for his friends. Well, that's serious love, right? I mean, somebody gives their life for you, we'd say, what's that got to do with love? That is what love is. You see, and you, you think of it in terms of your children. I think people can relate to that. You know, you may have all of this turmoil, tension, and stuff, but there is in your commitment to your child, assuming healthy parenting, I always understand that there, there are people in the world who aren't that way, but a, a healthy parent would die for their child. And see, that's what love is about. So when they're doing things, even though the, the child may be grumbling and saying, oh, you're torturing me. You know, why? What is motivating the parent? The parent is seeking to bless the child because the parent has the child's welfare in mind. And so take that to the ultimate extreme, would die to bless 
the object of love. That's what love is. And you think about that. Now, that's, that's serious. Love, something like, it, like that. See, it means a readiness to sacrifice for the benefit or blessing of its object, even to laying down our lives. Even that far for the benefit of other people. That's how we're to love one another. We just think of that. I mean, would that revolutionize how the world saw the church? If within the community of faith we had such bonds of brotherhood and fellowship that we treated one another that way, that we were willing to die for each other, do you think the world would detect a difference in this group of people that call themselves the body of Christ? Yeah. And that's what you saw happening early on. Let me read to you what I. Howard Marshall says in his commentary. All right, verse 17. But whoever has the goods of the world and sees his brother having needs and closes his innards. Uh, why did I put that in there? Normally the word's translated heart. It's not the word heart. Okay, I, don't, I think the word heart conveys the meaning, but the word that's used there is the word for bowels or innards, so, or entrails. Okay, so I did it that way, so it always, if I put heart there, when I looked at it, I wouldn't, it wouldn't alert me that that's not the word heart. Okay, and you say, well, that sounds kind of funny. But we, we do that, right? We say, I felt it in my gut. All right, we have, but here, I think, I think the way that if you were trying like a dynamic equivalent, trying to convey the meaning in our culture, heart would be the way to do it, okay? Now, some translations say closes his eyes, but it, that's, it, it's inner, it's, it's in the inside, you see. A person who has no compassion, they're not moved from the inside when they see this who has goods of the world and sees his brother having need and closes his heart, closes his eyes to his needs, on the inside has no compassion for them, how does the love of God abide in him? If you see that in your brother and sister, and we are called to love as Christ loved who died, well, then how can the love of God be in you? You're not moved at all to compassion for your brother or sister who's suffering. Here's what Marshall says. He says, readiness to lay down one's life is a high ideal to which may, we may enthusiastically consent. It's a fairly remote possibility. And if it did arise, we would probably make the supreme effort that would be required. Meanwhile, however, we are content to live our present comfortable life until that supreme sacrifice is demanded. No, says John, the moment is here now. If you have the means of livelihood in the world, and everybody who can afford to buy this book, his commentary, comes into this category, and you see a brother in want, and you show no pity to him, then the love of God cannot possibly be in you. Christian love is love which gives to those in need and so long as we have, while our brothers have little or nothing and we do nothing to help them, we are lacking in the love which is the essential evidence that we are truly children of God. Do you see how fundamental this is? This is basic, fundamental stuff that we are to love the brothers and sisters sacrificially and when we have and they are suffering, that we are moved to compassion that we help them. And if we turn a cold heart to them, it says something about our relationship with God, if we're willing to do that. Listen to what Aristides, Aristides was a Christian in Athens. Listen to what he wrote to the Roman Emperor Hadrian in the year 125. Okay, so we're, we're early, pretty early, first part of the second century, 125, Christian in Athens writing to the Roman emperor. He says, they, referring to Christians, love one another. They do not overlook the widow, and they save the orphan. He who has ministers ungrudgingly to him who does not have. When they see strangers, they take them under their own roof and rejoice over him as a true brother 
For they do not call themselves brothers according to the flesh, but according to the soul. You see, this idea that there is something meaningful in this idea, when we say brother and sister, it carries a spiritual reality to it. Those who are born of God, we have a bond with them. And though they come and we don't know them, they are strangers to us. The fact we are brothers and sisters, that's how they are. We bring them in and we welcome them. You see, and whenever, whenever they see one of their poor has died, each one of them, according to his ability, contributes ungrudgingly and they bury him. Well, this was important to be buried. And it was a big expense. And so what would happen when one of theirs would die? Would they leave them unburied? They would not. They would say, we will go together and we will buy for them what is necessary for them to be buried. He continues, and if they hear that some are condemned or imprisoned on account of the name of their Lord, 125, you see, been, been, uh, uh, being a Christian has never been easy. You see, they're imprisoned uh, on account of the name of their Lord. They contribute for those condemned and send to them what they need. And if it is possible, they redeem them. They pay the fine or whatever it is to, re to release them. So th there is no, their brothers in jail. Too bad for him. Too bad. My brother or sister is in jail because of their profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Well, I think that's just true. I hope somebody takes care of them. That's not how they operated. And if there is any that is a slave or a poor man, they fast two or three days, and what they were going to set before themselves, they send to them, considering themselves to give good cheer even as they were called to good cheer. So this gives you a glimpse, and there are other writings like this. It gives you a glimpse when you wonder... What was there about the early church that attracted the world? It was that they could see that these people are not like other groups. Now, why are they not like other groups? Well, there are a number of reasons for that. They believe in only one God. They believe in a resurrected Savior. But it is how they treated one another that caught the attention of so many people how they truly loved one another, how they did and gave for one another. Then he says in verse 18, he says, Little children, let us, let us not love in word or tongue, but in action and truth. You see, let's just not talk this fundamental obligation of loving our brothers and sisters. This idea, let's just not give it lip service, but let's love in action and truth. We must render true love. You see, love that involves deeds, not just talk. Love, as some have said, with skin on it. Actual doing for people. James wrote, you're very familiar with James 2, 15 and 16. What good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but, has, but does not have works? Can that kind of faith save him? A workless faith? A faith that is mere intellectual assent? That doesn't get into transforming a person's life? That is not a commitment to living consistently with that intellectual assent? Can that kind of faith save him? Is that saving faith? The answer is no. But he says, if a brother or sister is naked and lacking daily food... And one of you says to him, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, but you do not give, give to them what is necessary for the body, what good is it? Well, this is what's being said here by John. John says this idea of loving one another is foundational to who we are as the people of God. And the world needs to see that. The world needs to be impressed with how they treat one another and do for one another when you would find nobody doing that. They'd be going, what's up with these people? Why, when they don't have familial bonds, they're not physical brothers and sisters, but brothers and sisters of the soul, that they do for them. They bury them. 
They care for the widows. They do those things. Why? It is because we have been called out of the world and forged into a family. We are a real family. And that's what he's driving at, and that's something that's important to understand. Now, here he says in, in 3, 19 to 24, By this we will know that we are of the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows everything. We'll talk about that in a second. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we keep his commandments and practice the things that are pleasing before him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another, just as he gave commandment to us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And in this we know that he abides in us from the spirit whom he gave to us. Verse 19. He says, by this we will know that we are of the truth and will reassure our heart before him whenever our heart condemns us for God is greater than our heart and knows everything. See, by this, this refers to this example of faithful living that John has just mentioned to loving brothers and sisters in need with action and not merely words. You see, by this, by this, this example that he has just given, this example of faithful living, by this we will know that we're of the truth. By living that way, we will know that we're of the truth. That parallels what he said in chapter 2, verse 3. Chapter 2, verse 3 said, And by this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commands. You see, there's a parallel there. And so he's saying here, look, by this, by loving the brothers and sisters in deeds and not merely in words, we know that we've come to know him. There is reassurance in that. As I said in commenting on chapter 2, verse 3, we've sometimes deprived brothers and sisters of the God-given means of assurance when he says in 2, 3, by this we've come to, we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments because we say, you don't keep the commandments perfectly. And I say, I understand that. But that doesn't mean that we don't keep the commandments so that they can function as a means of assurance that we know our faith is genuine. I could say that about you and your marriage. You know, you don't keep your commitment to your wife perfectly to love her as Christ loves the church. But yet, if I ask you, I say, well, do you, you ever abandon your wife or break? No, no, no. I just failed to perfectly live it out, but I've always been committed to her. I've always sought her blessing. But sometimes I mess up. You see, sometimes I'll get angry in these things, okay? So you, you see that. And so the, the fact it's not perfect doesn't mean it can't function as a means of assurance. And that's what he's saying here. He says, by this we know, see, loving the brothers and sisters in the way that he's talking about, by living that way, we know that we are of the truth. That gives us assurance of that, and that knowledge that we are of the truth, that will assure or pacify our hearts before God whenever our hearts condemn us for the sins we commit. You see, this idea of, of having this assurance by having this fruit of faith where I know that my faith is genuine. I'm not a fraud. I'm not a I'm imperfect, but I'm not a phony. I'm living and trying to live in service of Christ. And as that fruit of faith, particularly he's speaking here about loving one another in deeds and not merely in words, as that assures us that we are of the truth, then that assurance pacifies our disturbed heart as our heart condemns us for the sins we commit and the reason that knowledge will pacify our hearts whenever they condemn us is that God to whom we know we belong because we are of the truth well how do we know we're of the truth we are assured we are of the truth because of the fruit of our faith so because we are of the truth we know that we belong to God and the reason that pacifies our hearts is that whenever they condemn us is that God, he's greater than our condemning 
heart. Well, what does that mean? He's greater than our condemning heart in the sense he is more merciful and he knows everything. He knows that we belong to him. So when you combine his mercy with his omniscience, and we know then that we belong to him, and we know that he is merciful and he is omniscient, then our hearts are put at rest when our hearts condemn us. This is the root of peace. This is how we live at peace. This is how we avoid being spiritual neurotics. Because we know that we love the Lord God and we seek to serve him. We don't focus on the failures and say, well, in this life that I'm striving to live for Christ and honor him and do for him and love him and serve him, that I mess up and fail and all that. We don't focus on those because our heart does that and tries to condemn us. We focus on the fact that we are of the truth, therefore of him, and he is merciful and he knows that we are of him. So that puts us at peace. You see, that puts us at peace and we're not neurotics. See, in 1 Timothy 2.19, this idea of God knowing those who are his, Paul says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, bearing this impression made by a seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord turn away from wickedness. See, he knows. He knows those who are his. He knows that. So in other words, the, the fruit of our faith testifies that we are God's children. That's the implication of being of the truth. And to be God's child is to have peace despite our sin because of the nature of God, because of his merciful nature and because of his omniscience. That's what I think John is getting at here. Now again, you see, he wants to assure them. Why does he want to assure them? Well, that's generally a good thing to do. But I think in the context here, he's wanting to assure them because they have been rattled in their sense of assurance by these people who are the false teachers who are telling them, uh, we really have the way to go, and you need, you need to be concerned until you get on board with our agenda. See, and I think that's what, so he wants to be sure that they know. Then he says in, in verse 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. You see, this assurance or this pacification of our condemning heart, this settling our condemning heart, this putting our condemning heart and stilling it. So as we fail and sin, you know, it's like, uh, uh, well, then we can be at peace. We, of course, repent, but we don't allow that to become something that threatens our sense of assurance before God. So that's what I mean by being a spiritual neurotic. We're not sitting here going, I did that, I did that, I'm lost, in, out, in, out. And we don't do that. Because if I ask you, do you love your wife? And you tell me, yes. Well, how do you know that? I know it. Okay, well then take that as a sense of, see, it's that sense of assurance that a person has. The person can be at peace despite the breakdowns and the failures. And that reassurance or pacification of our condemning heart, that generates what? Confidence before God. Not timidity. Not where I sit here and I go like I'm, I'm you know, coming and approaching the Wizard of Oz. You know, like I always do with the, the Tin Man, or Scarecrow, whatever it is, going, ah, oh, God, it jumps out the window. It's like, no. It generates, this pacification of our condemning hearts generates confidence before God, it's the confidence of a son or a daughter before a father. What is it? It's the relationship. And so there's confidence which expresses itself in requests made of the father. You see, that's because I'm confident. I come in as a child, a child of the father, and I walk in, and so I'm confident. That confidence expresses itself in requests. And then we see in verse 22... And we receive from him whatever we ask because we keep his commandments and practice the things that are pleasing before him. So this pacification produces confidence. In that confidence, we come boldly before God and we make requests. And you see that faithfulness or covenant loyalty. Maybe I can say it that way. Faithfulness or covenant loyalty is a requirement of being heard by God. 
This is something that God requires, as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 66, 18. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. I like to see, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. That was really my God. That's completely different, do you understand, from somebody who's like this, you see. So if I cherish it. But this idea of faithfulness or covenant loyalty is a requirement of being heard by God. That's why James said the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Or as John and I always joke, the prayer of a good-looking man. You ought to laugh. Why would we say that? <laughs> the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. You see the same idea in Psalm 34, 15, Proverbs 15, 29, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. See, we'll not be living sinlessly. I've said that many times. We'll not be living sinlessly, but we must be living righteously, meaning genuinely, not hypocritically, not like a phony, not like somebody who's trying to treat God like a chump disrespecting him and thinking we can get over on him. None of that. None of that. Genuineness, seriousness, pursuit of God. And as we limp along, fail, up, fail, up, you see? But you see that difference. So not perfectly, but genuinely and not hypocritically. And this is not the only condition of effective prayer, by the way. I know you know that. But that's not the only condition. It's the one that John wants to stress at this juncture because of the false teachers, because of their de-emphasis on obedience. So he wants to stress that. He says, and we receive from him whatever we ask because we keep his commandments and practice the things that are pleasing before him. Well, are you saying then that you're basically buying God's heaven? No, I'm saying I'm being covenant loyal. I'm being faithful. You see, that's what I'm saying. And that's what he's trying to stress here. He's stressing that about these people, and he's doing that. But it's not the only condition of effective prayer. To be effective, prayer also must be according to God's will. As we'll see in chapter 5, verse 14, and in John 15, 7. You say, well, what's that about? Well, there are some things that God's not going to do. Just like a parent. There'd be some things when your child comes and asks, you want to bless your child, but because of all that you know and what you're planning and things like that, there's some things you're not going to do. And that's how it is. There are some things that you're going to do regardless of whether somebody's asking. But there are other things that you're going to do only when someone petitions and asks. And what you have to be asking is something that is within this larger will of God. Okay, something that fits within that will that God can do consistently with that larger will. Okay, so that's, we'll talk about that more in chapter 5. But that dovetails with the requirement that the request be made in Christ's name that you see in John 16. See, it's, it's to be in accordance with God's will. You see, in that, in that larger sense. The prayer has to be with proper motives. See, meaning it has to be made with a sincere heart rather than to be seen by men, right? Matthew chapter 6, 5 and 6. You're up here praying, I want people to think I'm great. What do, you think that, what do you think that is to God? Okay, that's nothing. So it has, to be with, it has to be with proper motives. It has to be from a desire to glorify God rather than to indulge our selfishness, as you see in James chapter 4, verse 3. You don't get because you want to you know, use it on your selfish desires. You know, oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? You see? He may have in mind for you at Mercedes Benz. I don't know, but you get the idea from Genesis song. But so, so you, you have that, that idea. It has to be by one who forgives others, right? If you stand not forgiving, what's your God's not listening to that. Yeah, I know you want me to forgive people, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, but here, let me come and request some things from you. Well, you see what that's like, right? And it has to be one who, by one who believes uh, God's promises. He says here, Verse 23, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he gave commandment to us. Now, the commandment is singular. See, the commandment of God is singular, and it has two parts. 
one commandment consisting of two parts, and that's to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another. And I hear echoes here of, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love the neighbor as yourself. You see, he sits here, there's a command, and it has two parts, and it's to believe the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another. These form a unity. And they make explicit, by the way, what John has assumed all along about the indispensability of faith in Christ. You know, when I kept saying, you have to take this in context, you can't think that the atheist who's pursuing righteous living, that he's talking about him. Well, here he makes it explicit. This is the command of God, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another. So he makes that explicit. The righteous pursuing atheist is not a child of God. I don't think you would ever think that, but some people might. David Rensberger in his commentary says, by believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ, John means maintaining the full incarnational Christology that the opponents have called into question. Okay, I think that's important. You see, when he says here, believe in, this, in his son Jesus Christ, he's talking about this full incarnational Christology that God the Son became the historical person Jesus of Nazareth. This mind-blowing thing that God the Son, this person of the Godhead, has come and become Jesus of Nazareth. And so he says that we are, the command is to believe in the name of the Son Jesus Christ and to love one another. Too bad. Next week, Lord willing. <laughs>